many years ago when i was uh, serving in the ips and uh, i was still a very junior and inexperienced ips officer um one day i got a call from my ig's office and uh, i was told that the ig wanted to meet me and i was asked to go there so i landed there and uh, um, when i went there my ig gave me a piece of paper on which there was it was a long list so there were names of many head constables and against each name there was a name of a police station so then i asked him you know sir what is this so he said uh, you know these are some uh, transfers that uh, you know that the dgb wants to be done and uh, he mentioned name of some senior politician that you know they wanted to get this done so please do this transfers um, obviously i was i was surprised and a little shocked so i politely told him that i'm sorry but i cannot do this transfers then he said okay in that case you just go and meet the dgp and explain it to him so next time i went and met the dgp and the same conversation and again uh, again i told him that i could not do that and uh, then he gave me a he obviously got a little upset and gave me a mouthful but then the matter ended there now this was uh, this was probably the only incident of the kind that i faced in the service and and this brings to the topic that i want to discuss today which is political interference in police and so today i'm going to uh, discuss this matter threadbare and talk about the talk about many questions such as what is political interference how does it happen who do, who are the people who interfered and why are they most importantly why are they able to interfere how do they do that and lastly is there a way to stop or to reduce it right now we hear a lot about political interference and you must have seen this topic discussed threadbare in and tv channels and and various media but i want to take a slightly different approach i want to approach it and discuss it logically and critically as opposed to just saying that oh people are all bad and you know bad things happen that that's not very helpful right so now let's go methodically and and step by step we will discuss so first question that i want to ask is what is political interference is there such a thing right and then we'll talk about you know how and why does it happen now let's say you work in a company now your boss tells you that okay this particular thing has to be done in a certain way and he disagrees with your uh, with your style or your approach now you'll present a case but ultimately if your boss really insists that okay his way of doing is the right way then people have to follow the instruction so if you look at the state police the police works under the state government once again the police works under the state government not under the central government okay and who is the boss of the the, the police is organized as a hierarchy starting from dgp then there are uh, igs adgps then there is there are digs and there is an sp in charge of each district and each district has a lot of police stations this is how the whole hierarchy works now the top of the hierarchy is the dgp or director general of police who in turn reports to the government the political government which is represented by the chief minister and one minister who is in charge of the police department and he is called home minister now the word home may be may be confusing so home is it could just as well be called police minister but in india we call it home minister he is in charge of police and some other agencies like uh, like vigilance etc right now the question is if the boss of a company if the ceo of a company can give instructions to people working under him why can't the home minister give instructions to the dgp or to the to the to an sp or to a sub inspector or to a police station why is that illegal and my answer is i'll, I'll uh, the answer i'll give you is by using an analogy so let us say let us say there is a hospital and it's, it's a huge hospital and there is a ceo of the hospital and there are a lot of doctors some senior doctors some junior doctors now let us say i am a patient and i go to a doctor and uh, is a junior doctor who is uh, who is examining me and he is supposed to give me a medicine now tell me one thing can the ceo doesn't matter how big the hospital is doesn't matter how powerful the ceo is can the ceo walk in and tell the doctor no 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 don't give this medicine give this other medicine can he do that no he cannot do that why because the the, the doctor's job it's a technical job he is supposed to evaluate you and give you the right treatment or the right medicine it doesn't matter the ceo is junior senior that's not the point that's not his responsibility the responsibility is that of the doctor who's examining you similarly in exactly the same fashion the the job of the of the police department and job of police officers in almost in a in a vast majority of cases it is like that of a doctor 
when a person comes to you to give a complaint, you are supposed to objectively evaluate and say, okay, does the complaint here constitute a cognizable offense? In which case, he is required to register an FIR. Then when you investigate, you are supposed to evaluate, okay, is this person likely to have committed this crime? In which case, make him an accused. Then should I arrest the person? If arrested, should I give bail? So all these questions are, they are, tech, they are almost like a doctor examining and prescribing medication or prescribing treatment. It is a technical, uh, it's a technical role. Which means nobody from outside can come and tell the police officer or should come and tell the police officer how to do the job. In fact, in the Indian legal system, nobody is allowed to, to interfere with the investigation by the police. Even courts, even I would say, even the Supreme Court of this country cannot tell a, a, a sub-inspector investigating a case who should be made an accused or who should not be made an accused. The investigation process is supposed to be untouched by anybody except the investigation, investigating officer. This is the kind of, you know, legal protection that the law envisages. And yet, we rarely see that happening. In fact, what we see very often is almost exactly the opposite. I'm not saying all the time, not even saying most of the time, but a lot of the time, this is not what happens. So, which means interfering in police is, is not, is against the law, right? It's just like the hospital scenario. Now the next question is, who interferes, who, who interferes and how, why are they able to interfere? So here it's not just the home minister, it's not just the chief minister. In fact, very often those people will, will not be the one who are, who are interfering. Very often it would be some politician in the, in the political party, somebody who thinks is influential. Everybody will, I won't say everybody, but a lot of people will try to, you know, get their way through. And what will be the what will be the manifestation? How does it show up? So, as an example, let's say I have a I am victim of a crime, and I go to a police station. Now, the the police uh, may not want to register an FIR, but if I know somebody, if I know a an MLA or some somebody very influential, he can make a phone call, and that will ensure that when I go to the police station, I am received well. In some cases, if the person making the call is very influential, I may be even given very like you know VIP like treatment. I get my FIR registered, and hopefully, the investigation will move faster. During the investigation, people, you know, sometimes politicians can interfere and say, okay, this person should be made an accused or, or don't arrest this person. There are a lot of those kind of things that happen. And that is what I'm talking about, which is what is political interference. Now, here is the question. Why are the politicians able to interfere? I would, I would say, I could make a complete counter argument that, look, the job of a police officer, let's say an IPS officer, even junior officers, it's a, it's a government job. They have the job for next 30, 35 years. The, the promotion is, is time bound. So you know when you're going to become an, an, an SP or a DIG or an IG, even at the junior ranks, you know when you'll become a sub-inspector or an inspector or DYSP. So all those things are predetermined. Your salary is fixed. Nobody can remove you from a job. Then why, what is the insecurity? What is the, what is the mechanism by which politicians are able to control the police? And that mechanism is transfers and posting. Let me explain. Now imagine there is an officer, senior officer in the rank of, let's say, uh, IG, Inspector General. Now, that IG could be in charge of law and order, in which case there will be a post, let us say, IGP of a zone or a range, where he may control the police force of three or four or five or six districts easily. Right? Now, there is another position, okay, where, where he has, where he has work, you know, for probably half an hour a day where he doesn't, doesn't have any machinery uh, or doesn't have any team reporting to him or any, any uh, serious, uh, serious responsibility given to him. And he goes from, let's see, if I have, uh, if I am an IGP and if I have four or five district police forces reporting to me, so effectively, indirectly, I'm controlling a, or I'm managing a force of 10,000 people. From there, I'm put in a job or another role where I have barely have 10 people working under me. I have no role, I have no responsibility, and my sense of self-worth and importance can diminish gradually. So effectively, what the government can do is, in one single swoop, they can take somebody from, from being in a very, very big position, right, or rather, rather very, uh, I would say, important position, and put in a position where he or she feels absolutely uh, worthless. Now, this is the game that, uh, that they can play. And therefore, every, uh, therefore, a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people feel insecure. 
Right? This is number one. Second thing is, if people are corrupt, if policemen are corrupt, then they, they obviously want to be in positions where they can, uh, they can probably make money through corruption. So that is another way to control them. And I would say third, third thing, which is, which is true for, for even honest officers is that police, it's a very, uh, it's a very dicey, it's a, it's a dangerous job. We never know what will go wrong. If you are in charge of a police station, and if let's say someone dies in the police station in custody, the sub-inspector is in deep trouble, right? You conduct a lati charge, right? And somebody gets injured and there is some inquiry into it, again, you are in trouble, right? I'm not even talking about people doing wrong things. That, that is understandable. I'm saying even when you do the right things, a lot of things can go wrong. And in those situations, you are, you are very, very vulnerable, right? So there are all these reasons, you know, one is, uh, one is the ability of the government to put people in a very high position or very low position, right? Then second is corruption and third is this insecurity that police officers have. So all this put together makes the police officers and police department very, very vulnerable. And when you're vulnerable, what happens? Somebody can come and take advantage of that. That's exactly what happens. That is why, that is why politicians have such strong control and grip over the police force. So that raises a big question. Can we, can we stop this? And should we stop this? Is it a problem? Is it like a, is, of course it's a problem, but is it like a huge problem? I would argue that a broken police and justice system is the root cause of massive you know, civil disturbance in a society. A society cannot progress unless we have rule of law. If you look at the US, if you look at any Western economy, Right? The, economic, the economic strength that they have comes from businesses. Businesses go to a place where they, ex where they know what to expect. They, they expect safety, they expect law and order. So only if we do not have law and order, we cannot have any kind of economic prosperity. It is almost impossible. If, if let us say two people have a fight, right? then, then let's say if person A has a fight with person B, even if the person B has, or person A has, let us say, uh, you know, beaten up somebody, this person should at least have has the confidence, okay, if I go to the police or if I go to the, uh, to the courts, I can get justice. But when they realize that, okay, even if I go up, there is no justice, what will the person do? He will take law in his own hands. Another example, let's say there are two children who are fighting. So, uh, so there are, let's say, two brothers. Now, there's a fight between them. They know that, okay, I can go to mom and dad and talk to them. Right? And they will, they will, you know, uh, they will settle the matter. They'll, they'll do the right thing. But if... If the child believes that even if I go to dad, dad is always going to favor the other kid. Think about the mindset of that kid. What will, what will happen? He will become withdrawn, he'll become aggressive, and he will grow up into a person who, is, who doesn't have a, who, did, who never had a, had a good childhood experience. It will destroy his personality. Right? That is what happens. When we, when we, dis, when we meddle with you know, law enforcement, then it takes away the faith of people. People know that, in this system, you cannot get justice and they will then be forced to align with other people. Some people will, you know, tend to move towards criminal, uh, will try to, you know, find support elsewhere. I'm not saying that's justification, but that is a possibility. And therefore, having a, an honest law and order machinery and law enforcement system is the fundamental basis of any civilized society. So now we have, we have come to the final question on, and the biggest question, which is what can be done to bring down political interference. So let me first start with a story. When uh, you must have heard of T.N. Session, who was the chief election commissioner of India once upon, once upon a time. Right? Now, before he became the chief election commissioner, he was an IS officer. And uh, when he retired, he was the cabinet secretary of the country, which is the highest position in the bureaucracy. Now, when he was the cabinet secretary in the government, and, and he was obviously reporting to the, uh, to the political uh, establishment. He was known as a good officer, but beyond that, he did not really make any big impact. But when he became the chief election commissioner, he transformed, he literally changed the politics of this country. Right? Now, why was he able to, what was the difference? The same person, right? The difference was that as a bureaucrat, he was, he did not have any protection. He did not have any security of tenure, but when he became the chief election commissioner, he had a few years guaranteed tenure and it was a constitutional position. So nobody could come and interfere with him. No government could say, oh, you know, I don't like him. So now I'll throw him out in some other position. They could not do that. So when this person had that security, he was able to make a huge impact. Now, I'm not arguing that we can give the same security or we should give the same security to every position. 
that's not possible but but there has to be certain security of tenure now this idea of people let's say if somebody is posted as sp of a district or as a dig range or as dgp of a state there has to be certain number of years where he can serve without without being moved out now this idea is not new and it's already there there are already norms about you know certain tenure which should be guaranteed for is ips officers and so on but very often those uh, those norms are not followed number one number two is that even if you transfer somebody let's say government wants to transfer this police officer from from position a to position b if it is done if it is done in violation or against the norms there should be there should be a mechanism or a requirement for the government or for whoever is doing the transfer to give to give a full public explanation so as an example i am posting this person from here to there this is against the norms this is why i did that whatever i'm saying it may be right wrong that's that's a separate thing but you should not be like okay i don't like this guy so i'll put him from here to there i am not the king nobody is a king we live in an in a country where we have democracy we have law and order right we have rules so everybody should be accountable and they should have to explain anything that they are doing which is out of the way so this is this is number one the next thing we need to talk about is that there are there are lots of positions which a person of, of a given rank can occupy and many of those positions have essentially no role or responsibility so just to give you a sense uh, an an officer in the rank of igp may one day be occupying a position like i've discussed you know which is uh, very very powerful and then he can be put in a position where a sub inspector would have would have been enough right now by by creating all these all these fancy positions you know with inflated designations what we have done is we have given the ground for for political political establishment or for the politicians to play around and second we are wasting a lot of money putting somebody of a senior rank it costs a lot of a uh, lot of money in terms of salaries and perks and so on so all the positions which are not substantive they should be eliminated so that if i am an sp or a dig or an igp or whatever if there are men, there are let's say three or four or five or 10 positions i know that broadly all of them are are equal right in which case in which case it's hard to play around with me by posting me from here to there the third thing is at least for senior ranks we should take out the insecurity to some extent the insecurity they have because they can be put in a position without any without any work for years and years and years so they should not feel like you know they are trapped so the i i believe that this is a of course is a broader reform topic but there should be an opportunity for senior officers at least and maybe even junior ranks you know where for them to let's say take a sabbatical if they don't like uh, they, they don't want to work here they can go out for let's say 3 4 5 10 years whatever and work in private sector and then if they want to come back based on certain norms they can be taken back if the norms are met so so don't lock people in and then force them to you know fall in line with you right now all these things i've talked about none of them are perfect none of them will you know cause a massive change or they will they will they are not transformative but they are a good start but the most important thing in my opinion is that we need to have transparency people have to ask questions and and when we say we are talking about political interference one fundamental question i have for you is who is electing the politicians we are electing them if they are doing something wrong at a very large scale as a, as a as a class as a group if they are doing something wrong remember they are representing us they cannot do something unless we the people want them to do that thing which means ultimately we need to look at ourselves and see how as a society, as a society how as a community how as a country we need to change the way we look at things and the way we decide whom to vote for or what to look for in our politicians that's a long haul so anyway i'll stop this uh, uh, so i'll end the discussion here i hope you enjoyed this uh, video and i hope to see you soon in the next one thank you very much thanks